Thousands of years ago, the Buddha taught you are what you think. I am love. I am peace. I am joy. I am silly. I am powerful. So a modern philosopher coined the phrase that you are what you eat. I am organic vanilla ice cream. I'm chia seeds. I'm a good, strong cup of coffee in the morning. I am mac and cheese. Today, like millions of my human sisters and brothers on planet Earth, I'm becoming mindful about what I eat, what I think. But lately, I've been thinking about this. I watch what I eat, but do I watch what I want? What about what I feed my mind, my heart, and my soul? At Conscious Good, we believe you are what you watch. You are what you watch. Anytime you watch something that causes your soul to hurt, there's an impact. So what's the answer? At Conscious Good, we think it's about feeding our minds the same way that we feed our bodies. With nourishing choices. After all, if media can have a negative influence on behavior, it can also have a positive one. It's been proven that if we watch TV shows and videos about people helping others, cooperating and being generous, it can actually influence us to be more altruistic and kind to one another. Talk about paying it forward. So next time you sit down to watch your comfort movie, consider how you will feel afterwards. Will you be happy and energized? That's because maybe, just maybe, what you watch, read and listen to, matters. I am what I watch. So I watch what I watch. I am nourished. I am inspired. I am enlightened. I am a celebration. I am conscious. I am conscious. I am conscious. I am good. I am good. I am good. We. 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 We are. We are. We are. We are conscious good. Everyone wishes to live their best life. We experiment with various ways to achieve that, whether it is through study, competing, finding a partner, working hard, or admiring someone who inspires you. It is the quality of our inner being that does it all or grapples with fulfilling life's calling. For the past 20 years, the Brahma Kumaris in Washington, D.C. has been a space for any and everyone to enter into and experience one's soul calling. From 1997, the center opened in an old rickety house on Georgia Avenue in Silver Spring, Maryland, 
where cars and trucks that pass by would shake the space. But when you were inside, it was a peaceful and powerful sanctuary for all who visited. Since then, over 2,500 events, 17 city and nationwide initiatives, 21 awards, two meditation museums have served youths, senior citizens, entrepreneurs, scientists, authors, women, interfaith, the disabled, environment, small businesses, arts seekers, and even leaders. Millions of lives have been served, either through social media, the popular America Meditating Radio Show, or through exhibitions, lectures, partnerships and programs held in the meditation museums and centers. We look at 20 years of service as a continued journey of love, courage, wisdom, and determination with friends from diverse backgrounds and thought who believe a better world is possible when we make ourselves better human beings. Meditation is an important tool that helps us to gain greater clarity, insights, and inner power so we can make healthy choices and amplify our capacity to live a full life. In times of great anxiety, insecurity, and fear, meditation is an essential practice for everyone to gain stability and inner strength. Just look at what a few dedicated, purposeful, and kind group of committed people have been able to achieve in 20 years. Thanks to everyone who have supported us along the way and thanks in advance to those who believe in our work and power of intent. Brahma Kumari's Meditation Museums, where peace is inside. coming to you from San Francisco, California, and I am here to say that I love watching The Next Normal with Sister Jenna. I get transformed. I am inspired. It's deep. It's wise. It's wonderful, just like her. I hope you're watching it. Today. Hello, everyone. Om Shanti. Welcome to The Next Normal and in collaboration with America Meditating Radio Show. For the past few months, we've been really enjoying so many of our guest speakers from around the world who have come and offered us their expertise, their advice, their suggestions, their love, their time, their energy. During a particular time in history where so much has changed and we too are changing, at least I hope we are. <laughs> I know for me, I hope I am changing. And I can only say that at a personal level, my transformations especially in the last few months, have been really to check my thoughts at a deep, deep, subtle level to try to look at really where I am going with my life or where these thoughts are trying to take me and to see if I have the ability, the wisdom, the love, the kindness, the intelligence to be able to transform them and make them into something elevated, something pure, something that can generate peace on the planet, more love, more harmony, 
more understanding, and definitely more of the spirit of cooperation and empowerment. It is always my pure wish that you and your family members are safe and doing well. Um, I don't think we've ever valued health each other as we do now. I know it was etched somewhere deep into the corners of the soul, but there's nothing like a pandemic that can actually really bring you to a place of like, ugh, absolute frustration. And then you can get back to your sense of normalcy. But do we always need a tragedy to get to this particular place? Some of us are doing okay, and some of us just aren't. There are people around the world right now, leaders and countries, that are making sacrifices and feel that you're going to lose a few of your own people. That at some point in time, uh, it's better for me to fill my coffer because I think I know more or I have more and that I have this plan or this goes here or this goes there. And their people are literally starving to go to bed at night. They don't have, a, they don't have food to eat. I drive down K Street in Washington, D.C. next to the Watergate and there's a whole colony of tents put up of people who are living on the streets. This is in the United States of America. Right now at this particular time, businesses are closed, buildings are closed, people aren't opened. So even apartment buildings at once were leasing or stores and nightclubs and places where people used to go to, people aren't there anymore. They're just not in those buildings. And I know we're waiting for this to pass to find a sense of normalcy, but perhaps we need to think, how did we get here in the first place? The role of women today is very important. I think that we are looking at a particular period in history where any soul in the body of a female has a huge, huge, huge responsibility. They always have, but now more than ever, the role of women to be more empowered than they are is the call of the time. I was on a call with former Vice President Al Gore and we were talking about climate change and the release of his second um, documentary movie. Um, it was part two about the inconvenient truth, the sequel, part two. And something that Vice President Al Gore said and that really struck me very deeply. He said, until you empower a woman, the world will not be a better place. India, America, Europe, Africa, until you empower those young girls who eventually become young women, become mothers and then grandmothers, until we empower that particular genre of our civilization, this whole thing can't turn around. I'm looking even in our own Brahma Kumaris where it is primarily ran by female energy. And I have seen the nurturing, the quality, the kindness, the patience, the understanding that it has exuded in maintaining its integrity and its value. I'm seeing the living proof of what it's like when you empower the energy of women and to actually put them in service for the greater good. My guest is someone that I've met a few years ago. We've done a few projects and a few panels together and she's a phenomenal woman. It's Amadine Roche. She's a United Nations human rights and women's empowerment expert with 20 years of experience in conflict context across Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. She has participated in 20 peace processes around the world and worked with refugees in India, Kenya, Jordan, Lebanon. Amadine spent a decade in Kabul and is the founder of the Amudin Foundation in Afghanistan to promote, hear this, yoga and meditation to prisoners, women, soldiers, the Taliban, and children. She's also a yoga and meditation teacher, specialist on mindfulness, emotional intelligence, compassion, neuroscience, and conscious leadership, and an award-winning author, photographer, explorer, public speaker, and social entrepreneur. She's also an attorney, wonderful heart, huge heart, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome her to The Next Normal in collaboration with the America Meditating Radio. Hi, Amadine. Welcome. So glad that you could join us. 
Amadine, I can't begin to tell you how thrilled I am to have you all the way from Central Africa, here in the nation's capital and on the next normal. I hope you're okay and I hope you're safe and sound. Yes, good to see you again, Sister Gina. I'm indeed in Bangui, the capital of Central Africa, and I'm doing well. We are, okay. we are safe in Bangui. <laughs> Not the other part of the how, country, but Bangui is safe. How are the COVID cases there? Are they pretty stabilized? Because in America, they're really getting out of hand right now. Yes, unfortunately for USA and in Central Africa, I don't know if it's because maybe they don't do the count, counting, but only 64 people died out of COVID and 3,000 people got infected. So they consider that Central Africa is not affected by COVID and it's just coming by foreigners. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Always getting blamed, huh? The foreigners. <laughs> So let's talk about you and let's talk about life and let's talk about the role of woman. And before we go into our heartfelt chit chat, everyone, please sit back, relax and really enjoy this conversation between two women who are very passionate about being in service to humanity, but also appreciating the fact that they're in female bodies and they're definitely doing some impactful work in empowering the voices and the role of women today. Amadine, you are in Central Africa. You have traveled around the world. You have been a human rights lawyer. You have taught yoga and meditation to prisoners, to women, to even the Taliban, to children. What is it that is driving you to do what average people would say, this is insane? <laughs> Yes, well, what drives me is my heart. It's my wish for peace in the world and um, to do my part. I believe if everybody will do his part or her part, there will be a big change into the world. So when I believe in something, I guess it's what Gandhi say. If you know, you do. If you don't know, you don't do. But when you know, when you, know you do. And... Um, Living close by a spiritual master such as the Dalai Lama, I got inspired at the young age, at 18 years old, about the violation of human rights in Tibet and in the world. And I got passionate about the cause of women empowerment and democratization and human rights. And my, my dream was to join the United Nations, which I did 20 years ago now. And the flame, the fire is still alive within me. And I'm indeed still very passionate more than ever now to work on human rights, democratization, and women empowerment. Well, let's go back a little bit, um, a little bit over 20 years ago. How did you end up at the United Nations? And what was your role there when you started? And how did that sort of grow into you expanding more of your service to the whole world? Yes, my first assignment with United Nations was in Uzbekistan for a few months, but mainly in Tajikistan. And in Tajikistan, we were working with Afghan refugees, and I really fell in love with Afghan. And so I decided to go to Afghanistan just to know more about these uh, people. And I realized that they were a big inspiration for me after the Tibetan people, of course. And they were uh, an example of courage and resilience and, and grace at the same time and having faith and I got fascinating by then but I end up in Kabul by chance on September 11, 2001 and um, invited by the Taliban at this time and when I left the country before American bombing I promised myself that I will come back because it was the beginning of a democratization process in Afghanistan and I really feel like a real playground to work on human rights, to work on women empowerment. And uh, this is what I did in 2003. I came back to Kabul and worked with United Nations on civic education, on women empowerment and human rights. And since then, I've been doing this type of work all around the world, mainly in Asia, but also in Africa, where I am right now. It's amazing. Was there anything in particular in your journey so far that has been a life-changing event for you? 
Oh, I believe my life has been a lot of life changing. <laughs> yes, definitely. The small girl I, I led at the border, Pakistan and Afghanistan after September 11, she really asked me to save her life before American bombing. And unfortunately, I couldn't take her because she had a family. But I, she's the one who made me back to Kabul for sure because she came in my dream many times and asking me to save her and asking why I didn't save her from American bombing and I have kind of consciousness crisis and I say, I felt very guilty to have left this small girl, small Afghan barefoot princess, I call her, at the border. And she's the reason why I came back for sure. So she's the one who brought me back to Afghanistan for 14 years on and off. I really didn't plan that, but it happened. And another life change experience, of course, at 18, when I met this holiness dilemma, I say that before, but another one as well was after the, first kidnapping and after assassination of my colleague in Kabul, Afghanistan. And it's tipping point in my life. Why? Because I did ask myself who I am to work for peace in the world if I'm not at peace with myself, because I got very passionate about my job. And it's like a flame of fire that nurture, nurture you. But if you really, really let the fire express, you can burn yourself. And it's exactly what happened to me after working in Afghanistan and especially after losing so many of my colleagues. And I got depressed, I got burned out, and I did suffer of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. So it was a tipping point because I did collapse. I collapsed many times, actually, because I always come back to Afghanistan when I feel better. But I realized that the typical point was take a pause, go back to his holiness dilemma in Dharamsala, the one who inspired me the most on human rights and democratization. Take a pause, listen to the wisdom of the dilemma and see, see what he has to teach you. And this is what I did. And uh, it was in 2017, so 13 years ago, I went to Dharamsala, Makhlo Genj, Nashal Pradesh, India. And I went to all the teaching of his holiness. And he did say, and it was a tipping point, you cannot bring out a peace if you don't focus on inner peace. And it like shook, shook my all my foundation. And I realized this is the answer I was looking for. Who I am to work for United Nations peace if I'm not at peace. I should be an apostle of peace and I should not be a fraud, but incarnate what I preach. And uh, I took a sabbatical year and I took my backpack and I, I stayed in India for one year and just with spiritual master, Elias Goenka, I did my 10 days meditation retreat with him, but also with uh, Karmapa, Dai Lama. I spent time with Ama in Kerala, in Amritapuri, in South of India, and spent time also in Maharashtra, in Gandhi Ashram, to take the vows of non-violence. And, and, and I become a yoga teacher and meditation teacher and really, really changed my life because I realized peace that within. And, and I decided exactly 13 years ago, that was the journey of my life to alternate between outer peace and inner peace, but really, really put Beautiful. inner peace within myself first because otherwise I have nothing to offer and to yes, give. That's beautiful. Well, it's rich because I think a lot of us on the field of service to help humanity do reach a burnout point. And we do wonder, why are we doing this? And I think when the stars can be all aligned and have us turn inwards to really find what you found, that I can't help the world if I'm not at peace with myself. I can't change the world <laughs> if I've lost my peace because that's the reason why we want to be of service, right? Is when we can be internally at peace with ourselves, then we can understand the mechanisms required for human rights to really prevail everywhere. It has surprised me with all the resources that we have in the world right now, there's still billions of children going to bed hungry. There's still violence, there's still atrocities, there's still inequality between genders and races and and all of this ignorance that still takes place. Um, the term human rights does have some few interpretations, and I'd be curious to hear from you, when you hear the word human rights, what actually comes to your mind? What do you say for you, coming with the background that you now have, what's your definition of human rights? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, you know, we are going to celebrate the Human Rights Declaration, which was signed in 14, 1948 in Paris. 
And um, when I, I, I took the shelter as my Bible in my wallet, and one day I asked myself, which, which is the article I prefer in the Human Rights Declaration, the Universal Declaration? And I realized it's a preamble. It's a preamble because uh, it's not Article 1, not Article 2. It's the one who say all the nations are responsible to bring human rights. And human rights is values, values of peace and solar solidarity and respect for the dignity of men and women. And of course, they talk about men and women are equal. And um, I believe that for me, uh, again, uh, Human rights come from the solidarity of each nation to bring a better world. And the better world starts with solidarity. And I'm saying that especially now more than ever, when you see the polar polarization of the world, and uh, we, it's a reminder for us to stay unified because without unity, and I believe uh, for me, human rights is unity as well. Unity is like you remember who you are at the soul level, and we are one. That's it, and uniting nation, you know, and 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 also we talk about um, uh, yeah, human right, but it's men and women, all include as you one in the world. I like that very much. It's funny because I think until we get to that soul level, like you have, Amandine, it's if I consider myself a soul and I begin to reignite and experience the original nature of the soul, I won't see a divided humanity, I just can't, and I can't see hate, and I, and I can't see um, fear, and I can't see prejudice if I'm so conscious. And I think one of the most important additions that are needed in the world right now is a conversation around, do you know who you are? And are you aware of accepting yourself as a soul that has the innate natural religion of peace and love and purity? And if that's our innate religion and sense of self, then why are we acting the way that we are, you know? And so now we're looking at the role of women are really coming up, so to speak. In America, for the first time, we have vice-elect woman, a woman, Kamala Harris. She's also half Indian, half African. She's an immigrant, intelligent, um, married to a Caucasian, um, has traveled the world, a prosecutor, there are a lot of things about her that she seems to be pulling off. So she's been inspiring a lot of young women who look like her or who have thought of doing as much as maybe she's been doing. Can you share with me a little bit about where you feel the role of women need to be now and what do you envision them for the future? Yes, and congratulations for electing Kamala Harris as vice president in the U.S. It brings so much hope for women in the world and especially for America right now. And it's good balance because I do believe we need the divine masculine and the divine feminine right now. And to answer your question, Sister Gina, I do believe that more than ever now, women has a role to play into this world and especially on TV, this new world, this new earth that's giving birth right now and giving birth, as we can see, like Gaia kind of is shaking and asking humankind to wake up and wake up and ask women to wake up, wake up in their quality that they bring to the world, the quality of love, of caring, of patience, of compassion, of harmony and and all this beautiful beauty of grace, you know, this is what the world needs right now more than ever. And what I've been asked to all women, but also to all men to develop this quality, because unfortunately, what we observe in the world right now, it's a masculine, the young energy that predominates into the world. That's why I'm so fascinated and passionate about women empowerment, because, for instance, in Central Africa, where I am right now, when I, I, I create course on leadership and training for women to do their electoral campaign. We ask women, don't try to compete and become a man, but instead develop all your inner beauty and express your inner beauty and express, of course, your, your resilience and your dignity. You know, you are, you are an amazing example of serenity. You know what really impressed me? I came in Central Africa, which is the poorest country in the world, the last one on the index on human a human development index and i was i was wondering okay what i have to do is empower this woman but guess what 
I realized these women are the one empowering me because they went through so much. 80% of the country is covered by a rebel. And they've been through so much civil war and fighting only six years ago. And all of them are lost member of family and have PTSD. But they are an amazing example of courage and resilience. And they are the one teaching me respect, dignity, and sovereignty. And this is what the world needs right now. All these beautiful women who are becoming goddesses, kind of, or are stepping into the sacred, the divine feminine. And also, I wanted more... to say, because I realized I didn't mention... No, go ahead, continue, please. I realized when you mentioned before about peace, I, I just wanted to, to share something because it's so true. You have to find the peace within. And I realized 13 years ago, uh, when in 2007, I did for the first time a Vipassana retreat, all the 10 days I was in the past, in the future, my monkey mind went jumping, jumping, and never managed to be here and now. And it's only the last hours of the meditation where I finally managed to go deep, deep, deep within myself and found a place within myself of pure bliss, pure peace, like a diver, you know, who go to the abyss and never want to go back. And this is what I experiment. I experiment pure bliss and peace. And at the end of the class, they come and they just put their hand on my shoulder and say, it's over. You can leave the course now. You can break the world of silence. And I told them, no, because this is what I've been looking for all my life. And I just want to leave this place. And they were laughing. But I'm sharing that why, because I realized finally I got a point of reference within me of what peace, inner peace is. And this is what I wish for each single human being on the planet, because you know where to come yes. back. This is the source, this is home. That's what I also want to say, Amandine, that we can have that spiritual awakening or that spiritual experience. and bring it into action. It's not about just being away on the mountaintop and feeling your bliss and feeling your peace and then you come back to the world of chaos and noise and you want to run away. But you want to actually contribute to the chaos so that it can be at peace because now you know until an individual takes that inner journey, inner journey, go going back to the soul and really focusing on the energy behind the eyes and having a divine connection. I don't know how we're going to even understand the quality of energy that's needed for peace. You know, prior to you sharing about the experience of peace you had at your Vipassana retreat, um, I have to say, you were talking about the role of women, and I was wondering while you were talking about it as well, is there a connection between feminine leadership and human rights? Do you think there's been a missing link between the two? why this, there's still a very high percentage of the world under the violation of human rights? Do you think women really need to step up more That's now? Very, yeah, it's a very good question. And uh, yeah, definitely I do believe there is a link and I do believe the future is female, but women needs to um, meet themselves at the soul level and step into their power. Uh, power not in the ego sense, but uh, the power of the soul. And, uh, and they can go beyond where men uh, or patriarchy uh, uh, came until now. And I do believe, and you know, it's interesting because as I mentioned to you, I just finished three hours uh, meeting right now uh, with you and women in Central Africa. And on December 10, which is the anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, we are going to do a march, a march of women and it's a march, all, all women will wear white, as you, uh, Sister Gina, and it will be like a wave of peace, asking for peace in this country, because on December 27, we're going to organize a presidential and legislative election, and there will be a lot of violence, and the poor women who are candidates are going to be harassed and threatened to death, and uh, so we're asking the rebels or ex-armed group in this country to respect women. And I, I told the woman, if you unify, I can see it's like a tsunami wave of peace in this country because you are going to raise the level of consciousness. You are going to raise the vibration of this country. 
And this country is very fossilized with patriarchy and machism. It's the worst country in the world to be a woman. There is a culture of rape, there is genital mutilation, there is early marriage, there is uh, prostitution, sexual abuse. I mean, it's very tough to be a woman in this country. But I tell them, if you all unify and you just express your grace and your beauty and your courage and your harmony and compassion, I'm pretty sure that you will inspire a lot of men to respect you. Because you are respecting yourself. Was and this is what, what the was world needs right now. Woman, it's a, what the world needs right now, it's women who respect themselves and put healthy boundaries and say, this is, um, I respect my sacredness of uh, who I am as the soul level. Because I realized talking to this woman, they are lacking completely uh, confidence in themselves because they have been under submission to men since a young age. You know, all of them got raped at the age of 12, 13, and they consider it sexual education, but it's not sexual education, but they are losing their dignity. And they, uh, so they can be easily be considered an, as an object. But now if you restore their dignity, they can express themselves as a subject and be equal to men. Yeah. These are very, um, it's, um, <laughs> it's a hard visit. It's a hard visit. And yet it's not an impossible one to deal with when you are coming as an outsider into a particular culture and civilization that hasn't created a system that is there to support or to empower you. For example, America is now going through an awakening of uh, systemic racism. And it has been an interesting scene to watch Amandine of protest and policies and this re-election and half the country came out to vote this particular election. And a lot of it you know, you hear where half are voting for one and the other half, and many times I had to remind some of my friends and say, it's not half the country that really likes a particular uh, candidate or president. It's just that they vote because of economy. When it comes to certain countries, uh, for example, where you are, um, economy plays a very big role in terms of the leadership of that particular country. My question is, in what way can we somehow find a method or do you know of a particular method or are you engaged in a particular method that can somehow help to educate those individuals that are in positions of leadership who can actually trickle down particular rules and laws and systems to help their fellow citizens to do a big turnaround because I've seen that there is a level of corruption in some when they're in positions of power. And I'm not saying that it's the power that corrupted them. I've often felt that if you're uncorruptible, it doesn't matter how powerful of a role you're given, nobody can corrupt you. So it's not just about the position of power. But I'm, cu I'm curious to, to discuss with you any particular thoughts or ideas in how to really infiltrate leadership for them to somehow see that there's so much benefit in unity and shared interest rather than in trying to really take it all for myself and let a little bit trickle down at the bottom. As you watch your own citizens get raped or get hurt or get abused or get used for the sake of pennies, right? That's something that, I, that really gets to me. You know, at some point I'm like, come on, we do so much better if we all just do this together. And I know that we struggle with sharing power. I know that people don't want to relinquish power. How would you help to soften or educate those in positions of power to give them a sense that they will even become more powerful if they develop an interest of a shared economy rather than a my economy? I hope that question made sense. Yes, definitely makes sense. And uh, you talk about unity, and I realize this is what we are 
trying to do is UN Women here is at least to unify all the civil society of women and try to not make, make them in competition, but at least where they can be and working together hand to hands for their sister and the sister in the rural area. Because you talk about economy and it's many in the rural area, the countryside, which is like 90% of the country, the women are suffering so much and they are not independent financially. So with Rio and women, first we address the trauma because as I mentioned to you, there's this culture of rape and they are losing their dignity. So first we try to repair them and to do psychosocial uh, support, offer them psychosocial support. But after we try to empower them economically by offering microcredit in the field, for instance, to become a, a farmer or to uh, create soap for their sister. And after we finally, when they are financially independent, help them to become a leader, to face the government and to ask them to uh, be accountable. Because indeed, as you mentioned to you, as you mentioned, there is so much corruption in this type of country. And indeed, nobody makes them accountable because they don't have counterpart. But now empowering women, women are start to wake up and say, enough is enough. You know, what you, are you doing with the money? There is no road in the countryside. There is no hospital for kids. There is no edu there is no school. Even here, there is no teacher. They call it parents' teacher. It's like a parent who is educated, accept to welcome their kids in their house. This is what we are talking about in this country. And there is no uh, in infrastructure, you know. And uh, so now women who start to wake up and start to become financially independent and start to become a candidate for the legislative or for the local election next year, start to speak out to the power and say, now, if we take the lead, we are going to manage the, the money of the government and another way because we do care for kids and we do care for family and uh, enough of his corruption. When you definitely empower a woman spiritually, it's hard for her to attract someone to destroy that. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind. And I believe that the role of meditation and yoga is a boon. Are you teaching the woman yoga and meditation as well as part of the leadership um, tr training that you're doing there? That's a very good question, Sister Gina. As you mentioned before, I did teach yoga meditation in Afghanistan with the Amanodin Foundation I did create 10 years ago. And I duplicate that because I create the inner peacekeeping program where we were teaching the tool of inner peace and resilience and emotional intelligence yoga meditation in refugee camp in Jordan. And also I was teaching this program to the Libyan leader who have been uh, in a blast from uh, ISIS and where 26 of their colleagues died and they were all suffering of PTSD. So thank you for asking me this question because last week I was with the foundation of Dr. Denim Mukwege. I'm sure you know him, he's a Peace Nobel Prize from Congo. He got the prize two years ago with Nadia Murad from uh, Syria and um, Denis Mukwenge is coming to Central Africa to open an hospital, a French hospital, to repair the woman from rape. And I was speaking with them and I said, you know, I would love to offer the tool of inner peacekeeping to this woman. So we, are, we decided last week that I should start to teach yoga and meditation to this victim of rape. That is great. I'm so happy to hear that because when she can bypass the trauma of what she's gone through, even though she might think it's a form of sex education. I think her being able to tap into her inner peace and looking at the power of her inner purity, where she can recognize how powerful that energy is. In Indian culture, there are um, the, what's known as the Shiv Shaktis, you know, these deities. And there are predominantly about 108 and 108 have one particular speciality that they've pulled from God to take care of any demons that appears in front of them. What's your one speciality that you're pulling from God that seems to be assisting you in destroying, you know, whatever the low vibration might be that comes in front of you? It's an interesting question, actually. I'd never 
really think about this question before, but because you say that, I realize that yes, I'm a, an instrument and I try to put myself aside and just allow the divine to use me. And um, I realize I receive so much energy when I'm, I'm teaching this type of tool to women. And I do believe I have an army of angels with me. So you, you name them, it could be Archangel Michael, or it could be, uh, especially, especially if I feel the inner resistance of inner demons fighting me or inner resistance. And so I guess uh, Archangel Michael is using me. Or also sometimes I have a message to deliver. So I guess it's uh, Archangel uh, Raphael. Oh no, Gabriel, sorry, Archangel Gabriel or Raphael, more for healing. And, um, but I guess also my own guides. And um, yes, and it's Kama Yoga because you were talking about India and talking about the fact that being at service. And uh, I realized, yes, I dedicate my life to, I love yoga so much. I love unity. And you mentioned the fact that, yes, when you are suffering, this type of tool help a lot. And I always say that when you suffer of PTSD, you are 75% dead, which means only 25% of your soul remain within yourself. And all these tools help you to bring back mind, body, and spirit as one inside yourself. And you reconnect to your soul, and you remember who you are, and you become fully alive and transform because you've been through this rite of passage, kind of, what makes you stronger. And uh, it's fascinating to see them transforming. It's like giving birth giving birth to their soul is like uh, Socrates, Socrates say the maiotic, you know, and, uh, and I love doing that because at the end of this journey, the women are fully transformed and they want to become yoga meditation teacher because they can see the benefit on their body and mind and spirit. I wish the whole world would practice yoga and meditation. And I mean, I go back to India and I look at the root of civilization where um, the mysticism and the spirituality reeks in the land and uh, just be more reflective. Um, be curious about the world behind your eyes and, and who you are being called to be at a higher level rather than allowing the distractions to take you at that lower vibration of what I always say, this word algae, which you must have heard me use on all the platforms <laughs> we've been on together in the past over the years. But I'll tell you this, this anger, lust, greed, attachment, and ego is why there are these violations towards our human rights, our fundamental tenets of who we're supposed to be. And I continue to really look into the heart of souls with the intent to say the opposite of your algae. Once you get rid of that, there will be world peace. And so, yes, through the portal of introspection, yoga, meditation, karma yoga, raj yoga, it will help us to identify what we are doing to ourselves that's actually making us give sorrow and also take sorrow from others. I want to ask you, um, I'm going to throw out a few words to you. It's going to called it's rapid fire. And I'm just going to mention just a few words, and I want you to share with us what comes to your mind first and foremost. You ready? Oops. Soul. One. Source. God. One. Source. <laughs> Karma. Destiny. Infinity. One source. Truth. One source. <laughs> Power. Ego. <laughs> Amandine. One source. Beautiful. This was, this was delightful. Uh, any thoughts that you'd like to leave with our incredible audience? Something to leave us to be inspired by and to just keep looking for the silver lining in life. You are on the ground, you're on the field, you are fulfilling your purpose, your call. You've been through it. You've seen treacherous things that human beings have done to one another. You've seen the most beautiful things 
that human beings have done for one another. You have identified PTSD as living as a corpse or in a coma, where 90% of your life is totally useless. There are some of us who haven't seen half of what you've seen, but we're still struggling with that particular numbness of awareness and consciousness, because we've just not been coming from our soul conscious you know, way of being or soul conscious self. So here we are, we're approaching the holiday, we're approaching the UN celebrations, and the world is still in a pandemic. Governments are changing. Things are very unique right now. When you sit in your quiet moments and you think about life and the world, what's the narrative that emerges for you? And what would be the message that you would want to leave humanity? It's mm, a beautiful question. No, I realize so many people come to me and ask, what can I do to help you or serve? And I always tell them, go deep within yourself, find who you are, and you will find your inner gift. And I believe we are all, we are, we're all born with a sacred gift to offer to humankind. For instance, you, Sister Gina, you have an incredible soothing voice and uh, that's why you found your your path of many other like especially this type of podcast and podcast and just listening to your voice i can really feel the healing power of it and so don't ask the, what the world needs ask yourself what makes you alive because what the world needs more than ever right now it's people alive and so if your enough gift, artistic gift, is singing or dancing or sculpting or playing music or cooking or gardening, go for it and become a master of it because you will be so happy, so full of joy to do that, that you will inspire others to do the same and you will not have time to sing about division and violence and separation and fighting with your neighbor or with your mother or with your kids because you will be fully fulfilled with your own passion, with your own sacred gift. And so the only work you have to do is to, within yourself, on yourself, to go deep within to discover who you are. Right. Amadine Roche, thank you so much for joining us today on The Next Normal and also with America Meditating Radio. And hopefully I'll get to see you when you're back in the nation's capital, but I'm pretty sure I'll be seeing you online <laughs> sooner than later, definitely. Thanks again for your love and your service and for your beautiful spirit. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Gina. It's a real pleasure. I'm delighted to be with you again next time on this podcast. To all the women for me there, I love the pictures that you sent me. They're really gorgeous. Um, so lots of blessings and um, lots of blessings for each and every one of them. Lots of protection and pure vibrations around you, around them. And hopefully we're moving towards our golden age. You know, suffering can only go so long. There's got to be a time for the golden age to open up. And mm -hmm. having you there, I'm sure, will be helping a lot of them to move towards that. So all the best. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me again. I really appreciate it. such a beautiful angel and inspiration for the world. Thank you for what you're doing with Prama Kumari and for the world as well. You definitely found your path and your passion and you are a master on that. And so I want to acknowledge you. Thank you, beautiful sister. And I'm so happy we will connect again in this lifetime. Too. Me too. Take care. <laughs> Bye. I hope you enjoyed our time with Amadine Roche all the way from West Africa. And um, again, imagine when you just answer your call, uh, how the angels support you in situations unfold for you and bring you into a place where you make an impact on the life of others. We're not here just to live out the narrative of I, me and mine. We're here to live out the narrative of us and we, and I'm sure you're feeling it during this particular pandemic. If I raise you up, I'm gonna be raised up. It's not just about you anymore. It actually never was. It was always about empowering each other. And 
recognizing that power comes in a gathering rather than as an individual. It is not just about one person yielding and pulling everyone's resources to be of power. It's about everyone having a shared interest and enough for everyone to be in power. I know that algae is what's making this equation be totally off, there's no doubt. This anger, this lust, this greed, the, this attachment and ego is what is giving sorrow to each other. We are only unkind, jealous, hateful, racist, prejudiced, greedy because of algae. Meditation, yoga, introspection, spiritual knowledge, having conversations like these will help you to move away from that debilitating energy and that energy that puts you in positions that your dignity isn't in check. So let this be the period in time in your life where you are so determined to do whatever you can do to stop thinking from a place of anger, lust, greed, attachment, your ego. It's a big assignment, but if you can step into that level of inner leadership, you will definitely be an instrument for creating a golden age. Lots of good, good wishes, lots of love. Thanks again for joining us. Be very well.
Hi everyone, it's Sister Jenna from America Meditating Radio. I hope you've been enjoying Wisish, which you can get live on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube from 8.30 a.m. to 8.45, but you can also get it on demand 24-7. It's going to be your power boost for the morning. It's your daily dose for the soul. It's just going to encourage you to make the day that much more valuable. So join us. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank 
Thank you. 